everyone for uh, joining us. Thank you very much for the support for last week. Um, a solo episode, which are always a bit more uh, daunting, but um, everybody always makes it worthwhile uh, afterwards. Uh, and you know, you know the usual support that I got um, during the week for the for the episode and uh, for previous episodes. It's always great. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel as always. Uh, listen, our guest this week. We'll get into it because this is the important part uh he is a mu- musician he's been a guitarist for people like fatalist dido our very own Sinead o'connor and um, he's works with his own band slovo at the moment and he is the author of sound system the political power of music and he is mr dave randall how are you doing dave i'm doing great Derek. thanks for having me oh no you're more than welcome um very daunting list of acts that you've you've played with uh i don't mind saying um just the the sheer um well, I guess I guess it's not just the site. A lot of the times, I guess people, when I talk to people about you were coming on, and I mentioned Faithless, and people, oh, amazing, Sinead O'Connor, other people were t- finding it a, a incredible, huge acts um, to be part of. Yeah, it was a real privilege to work with each and every one of them. Um, Faithless, of course, I worked with for the longest period. Uh, in fact, there were two spells. I worked with them from the very beginning of the live band, mm-hmm. um, just after Insomnia had blown up as a hit across Europe and then beyond way back in 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, and then I had, and so I, I worked with them through to 2000. And then I handed the, the guitar duties over to Nemo Jones for about three years while I went off and made the first Slovo album and I also worked with Emiliana Torini during that period. But then I rejoined Faithless in, I think, uh, 2004 and stayed with them through until 2011, the official sort of last gig at the Brixton Academy. Um, and I suppose because of the um, the kind of the endorsement that goes with playing with a big band like Faithless, I suppose because of that, friends musician friends put me forward for for the other gigs that you mentioned mm-hmm. well actually dido was pre- preceded the dido recordings for her first album preceded faithless but then there was faithless for a long time and uh Sinead o'connor more recently but it's been great i mean i've been very lucky very lucky and, and, and that's not some sort of false modesty um i mean the truth is i just sort of in the late night mid to late 90s i think i found a sound and a niche on the guitar that worked for electronic music. And then I kind of, you know, broadened out a bit from that, but I'm not, when it comes to lots of genres, I'm not a particularly clever guitar player. But, um, I just got lucky and uh, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Great, great. Um, so we, we always start, Dave, um, with a, a short history of your upbringing, please. Huh. Um, well, to, I mean, you know, to, I hesitate to say it, but in, in a sense to me and to, I would imagine lots of your viewers or listeners, it's not a particularly interesting one, but on the other hand, maybe all upbringings are interesting um, in certain ways. I, I mean, I grew up in Southeast Essex um, uh, with one brother and a mum and dad who, who, you know, I, who, who were, who were good. They were good parents. Um, it's, it's interesting to me at the moment, the question of parenthood, because I've got a two year old, well, he's just about to turn two and he's my first. Um, so I became a dad relatively late in life. Um, and it's only now that I'm really confronting all sorts of questions about my upbringing and, and, um, you know, considering what I would want to do the same and what I would want to do differently and so on. Um, but you know, essentially my mum and dad were great. Me and my brother weren't particularly close and have continued to not be particularly close, but that's fine too. Our, our relationship is, you know, is, is amicable. Um, it was through my best friend's older brother that I was first introduced to guitar and to music in a kind of a serious way. It was he who was listening to lots of interesting records that I had never come across before. And um, by the time I was about 13, I think I knew that I wanted to pursue music in quite a serious way. And then I got a job in, in a Saturday job initially in the local guitar shop. And um, 
and soon after that so i was probably about 16 and i went on the road as a roadie to a kind of a a kind of a pub rock and blues band called the hamsters who were actually brilliant at what they did um they didn't take themselves too seriously but um but they were brilliant musicians and still are brilliant musicians so that so i sort of when it comes to music i sort of had had a bit of an old school apprenticeship really schlepping around the clubs of the, of the uk um learning from you know learning from the, the the blokes in the band that i was lugging um equipment around for i don't know if this is 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 a thing i've, t- I've spoken to musicians on here before um the, the next question is always like when did you become aware of mental health and uh, it seems that uh, creative people and mental health can at times go hand in hand. Yes, that is certainly true. But I, I, I need to speak to people more clued up than me mm-hmm. to know whether it's simply that artistic people have the um ability to articulate what they're feeling in a way that makes them more understood or noticed or seen than people with other careers or jobs um i mean i you know i don't know i would hesitate to say that there's some sort of actual Mm. uh, statistical correlation between creative careers and, and and mental health issues but you know that caveat said um it's certainly the case that many of the creative people who i knew and who i have worked with over the years have um confronted mental health issues and and indeed lots of other people in my life including many of my best friends um the curious thing i mean you know when, when you mentioned the question when did i first become aware of i mean the curious thing is that uh Let's see. I mean, my early years were in the mid 70s. I suppose most of my school years were in the 80s. And that was a period where uh, it seems that mental health wasn't really, you know, people with mental health challenges and problems were stigmatized in all sorts of ways. But there was no useful kind of uh, understanding of mental health. And and so for me, it's almost as if it, it it didn't exist as a as a legitimate legitimate category. There were just people with all these different sorts of problems, um, you know, be it alcoholism or or um, or de- you know depression. Oh, he, such and such can't get out of bed, or um, or you know, um, very serious um, episodes, mm-hmm. health episodes. And and the first time I remember coming across one of those was indeed in that guitar shop on a Saturday. Uh, the woman whose job it was to clean that shop. Uh, came in one day during and she was experiencing a mental health episode and so her behavior was was completely out of character and um and it was you know it was an older colleague who sort of took me aside and tried to explain what was happening and and he also tried to shield her Mm -hmm. from the boss you know he was worried that if the boss saw this that she would lose her job and she and he knew her and her family and and wanted to look out for her and her family. So, so, you know, it was a very unenlightened time. And therefore I think I became aware of mental health as a kind of a a category that affects us all and that we should all become more aware of and more knowledgeable, more knowledgeable about. I think that that didn't happen until who knows, you know, well into, well into my teenage years, probably. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people will have that. We've had such a wide range from that question. You know, it's fascinating to to hear the different uh, times and years. And uh, and obviously, depending on when you grew up or where you grew up, uh, it, it's been quite different. And it's always fascinating to hear. Um, I wanted to find out about your um, your earliest musical influences. Um, well, you know, in, in the... 80s I suppose the pop music of the time was all around me and some of it was very high quality you know Michael Jackson with Eddie Van Halen taking the solo on beat it and and um um Ray Parker Jr doing the outro rhythm guitar on uh Billie Jean and and so so you know the pop music was played by brilliant musicians and of course 
um, a lot of Michael Jackson stuff produced by Quincy Jones, um, uh, Prince, uh, and then, and then, you know, then the British and Irish pop music as well, of course, um, Sinead O'Connor being, I mean, you know, her cover of nothing compares, of course, that was a, you know, a big anthemic tune in my sort of teenage years and for everyone else at the time, um, ditto the fine young cannibals al uh, mm -hmm. album, the raw and the cooked. And I mentioned that because I currently work with Roland Gift, the singer of the Fine Young Cannibals. So, you know, it, that, so that's one really amazing thing for me is that I've sort of uh, found myself working with two of the people that I used to gaze up at MTV. While I was working in that Saturday shop, I would gaze up at MTV and look at Sinead sing that song or look at Roland Gift sing Johnny Come Home or She Drives Me Crazy. And um, so it was a real thrill to work with them a few years down the track. Um, but I've gone off topic. Remind me, Derek. What no, no, it was just for your 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 <laughs> earliest influences musically. Earliest influences, right? So, but in addition to the pop music, in addition to the pop music, I also had people like my friend's older brother and my colleagues at that shop in South End, Honky Tonk Music, it was called, playing me more, you know, more sort of or under the radar, more um, esoteric or more left field stuff. So everything from early blues to um, to sort of um, Noi and um, Can, you know, Croit Rock or, um, sorry, Kraut Rock or um, um, reggae um, and some, a little bit of free improvised music as well. There was a guy called John Seagroat, a saxophonist who I worked with, who would play me some really way out there stuff. So I was lucky, you know, sort of older people um, around me introduced me to a whole bunch of different things um, and really helped me with the guitar, actually, you know, really helped me to, uh, um, I had a guitar teacher called Andy Billups, who was also the manager at that shop, and he would really look out for me, you know, he'd get me gear that I couldn't afford to buy otherwise and set up my guitars and he um he was a great mentor and continues to be a great friend so i was very lucky with the network of people around me i uh went down the route of kind of um watching faithless uh live performances which are which are good self on the guitar and uh, you know to one to listen to you know more of faithless as a live act rather than what i knew of faithless as a you know the the recordings um i did, you mentioned it already but i did find it fascinating how you fit how you fit the guitar into the idea of electronic music. Um, how big of a challenge was that? Um, well, I think I was the right person for the job, actually, because I think I was already really interested in uh, dance music and techno music and you know electronic music in general. Um, so although I was a guitarist, I was thinking very much about how guitar can fit in to these different genres and also very inspired by people like Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, who was using guitar in a pretty unconventional way, you know, using it to get little sonic hooks and textures, um, you know, rather than traditional bluesy licks and bar chords. And, um, and so I was kind of already thinking about how I would do that when I was approached by Faithless to come and to come and give it a go. Um, so yeah, so I think that musically, I was already thinking along the right lines, which is essentially to keep out the way of of the of the keyboards. You know, mm -hmm. since this is playing the famous riffs, my job is to decorate those or, or to add a kind of a a kind of an emotional counterweight or counter narrative, or so, you know, to sort of. Mm -hmm to work around the main show in town, which is the, the synthesizer riffs. And of course, Maxi when he's rapping. Um, but I also, but I think I also kind of got, um, got, got it musically because I also was developing an interest in the, the, the politics behind dance music, which at the time, it's very different now. It's been very co-opted and commercialized for, you know, a long, long time now. But in the mid to late 90s, there was still a memory of the kind of the free rave scene and the idea that that it's not about individual egos. You know, it's not about showing off and, you know, it's not about rock stars on stage 
um, doing their cock rock thing. Um, rather, it's about creating this shared um, atmosphere, which hopefully, you know, leads to a kind of a, a shared euphoria. It's it's this sense of community, this understanding that you are just a small cog in a machine and the machine is all about maybe the machine is a bad metaphor but you know but, but you, you're playing a small part in a communal event which um in which the audience is just as as important as mm -hmm. as anyone on stage you know so politically i got that and i think that helped and i think it like that leads great uh, really well into your band slovo who's it slovo who's it described as a musical collective but there's a huge, like, different genres put together. And like you say, it's not about the idea of one person or a group of people being, st like, standing front and centre, trying to be the star. It works as a, as a unit, as a group. Um, how did that come about? Well, I think, you know, I have to name check the band who pioneered that model in the UK and, and Massive Attack springs to mind. Um, you know, I suppose essentially producers mm. who wanted to work with different singers um, or perhaps frustrated artists who couldn't sing, to put it more cynically. Either way, I was one of them. I was, a, you know, essentially I was a producer who wanted to work with different, uh, not only singers, but also spoken word artists and so on. And um, Slovo was my, was my attempt to do that. And, and indeed to talk about questions that mattered to me. So broadly speaking, political questions, you know, not not necessarily with a capital P, not necessarily vote Jeremy Corbyn or anything, but but, you know, with a small P exploring the um, all of the questions that confront us all, including feelings of alienation, including feelings of loneliness and so on. Um, and Slovo was my attempt to do that. I mean, th the one thing that I'd add, though, Derek, is that um, although we've made three Slovo albums over the course of 20 years, um, and, and, and we have a network of fans around the world who, you know, who have been great, it's quite a small network and we've never had any big um, music industry backers. Mm. And I think that part of the reason, I'm not saying it's the whole reason, I'm, I'm sure that some of the songs could have been stronger and so on, I'm not, I'm not putting it all down to this. But I do think that when you've got that kind of collective, um, that's a bit of a turn off for the industry. You know, they like to promote a single artist. They, they like to be very clear about who the star is. And then, of course, they want to, you know, work on the image of the star, get um, get uh, what do they call the people who choose your wardrobe for you stylists in and so on. And so, you know, I think that that's one of the drawbacks with a collective. Mm. I mean, the, the hand of the industry is being forced a little bit at the moment because of scenes like the South London jazz scene where um, the idea of being in collectives, in other words, playing in different bands, similar music, similar lineups in different bands is becoming more and more um, popular with music fans and musicians. So, um, um, but but I don't think the the music industry are keen on it. In fact, you can see a parallel, I think, with hip hop. With hip hop, um, many of the early hip hop bands were crews. They were, you know, they were kind of a number of different rappers and artists coming together under an umbrella name. But as time goes on, it generally gets distilled down to the one person who the music industry wants us to sort of buy into and wants to become the the star and I think that's a shame again I think there's a, a political subtext to that which is predictable but but rather regrettable yeah that's fair enough. um just allow me Dave to just read out an advert because these are the things we have to do uh, sure. you know and we'll get right back into it I'll get this right Fusion Training Centre Monksland at Lone a place to train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu kickboxing martial arts and CrossFit a great atmosphere of experienced coaches and a real sense of community if you want to join the team, find us on Facebook at Fusion Training Centre or drop in for a chat. Fusion Training Centre, train like a warrior. Um, I noted that uh, in your book, the first um, kind of, the first thing that came to you when it came to political kind of messages and, and lyrics uh, was to do with free Nelson Mandela. Mm. Um, what age would you have been around then? 
I think when I heard the song, which was probably not when it was first released, yeah. I think I would have been about 14 or 15, I think. Um, Why did it leave the impact, do you think? Um, well, for one thing, it's a very well-crafted song. You know, Jerry Dammers did an amazing job. Um, there are some of the lyrics, though, which I, I, I would, you know, which I think are politically too weak but that that's mm -hmm. that's kind of splitting hairs it's a fantastic song um and and i suppose it just left me wanting to know more not only about where the song came from as in you know who are the musicians behind this what's the scene behind this but of course wanting to learn who on earth nelson mandela was because i'd never heard his name before mm -hmm. until that song came along um and it was also the way in which I heard the song, which was at a music festival. And so I was surrounded by thousands of people hollering the hook, free Nelson Mandela. So, so that makes a difference, you know, yeah. there was a communal, a powerful communal setting for the consumption of this song for the first time. And it did, it left me kind of asking the obvious questions. And funnily enough, when I did some research into the song for the book, I discovered that it was a similar story for Jerry Dammers himself. But he went to a gig, I think in Alexandra Palace um, in the early 80s, and heard a South African artist perform, Julian, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to remember his name, Benulu, maybe? Anyway, apologies. Um, I guess your listeners can look, can look, can look them up. Yeah, but um, Jerry heard this song. It was the same thing. He'd never heard of Nelson Mandela before. I mean, it wasn't the same song. It was a, a different song, of course written in honor of nelson mandela and um and it, it was a sort of a you know a turning point for jerry dammers and indeed i think that struggle against apartheid in south africa was a key um, politicizing thing for many people of our sort of generation i think jerry's a little bit older than me well he must have been uh to have been releasing the song when i was 14 but you know roughly our generation i think it was such a stark issue but nonetheless one that divided this country. I mean, let's not forget that when Jerry Dammers had a hit or the special AKA had a hit with Free Nelson Mandela, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, our prime minister at the time, was still describing the ANC as a terrorist organization. Yeah. Um, and high street banks were still invested in the apartheid system. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a kind of a key fault line issue for, for my generation and a key politicizing issue for me. I was very naive in my thinking before I read your book uh, when it came to politics and, and political movements within, within music and how far they went back. Um, you had a quote from uh, 380 BC, and I'll just read it out uh, in my best voice. So nodes of music are never disturbed without the unsettling of the most fundamental political and social conventions. And that was by Socrates, I, I believe. Um, <laughs> I, I, like I could not get my head around the 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 three eighty BC the idea of um, these you know great thinkers uh, worrying about or maybe not worrying about but forewarning people about the idea that music can affect us outside of maybe enjoyment and entertainment. Mm. It, well, yeah. Um, I mean, don't forget uh, to quote Karl Marx that the history of all class society is the history of class struggle and therefore in ancient Greece where you know Socrates was waxing lyrically in the marketplace there would have been some concern that the slaves because it was a slave economy there would have been some concern that the slaves might you know step out of line and how do we deal with that and so on so you know um, the issue of how do we control um an oppressed population we you know how do we the ruling class from from that from that perspective that predates capitalism um and so too does the possibility of using music as one of the tools to uh, either placate or to distract uh the, the 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 population or indeed to prepare them to go off and, and fight your wars you know whatever it may be um music has been has been looked at as a as a sort of a, a, a um you know one one of the weapons in in the arsenal uh 
but equally it's always also been used by ordinary people in the other direction as it was it's always been used by ordinary people to assert themselves and to um to bring a sense of community to people to sort of uh, bring a sense of solidarity to people laboring alongside one another in the fields and um and and of course to criticize uh leaders to um to well at the very least speak truth to power if not to um abuse power i think felicuti would be nigeria's felicuti would be mm. an example of somebody who um uses music to directly kind of abuse and um and uh, attack people with power but he was tapping into a kind of a long-standing west african tradition which predates capitalism by presumably a few millennia uh which is very much to well to to praise the ruling classes but also speak truth to them so yeah it's mm. music has been part of the of the social contract if you like for as long as class societies have existed so you know at least five thousand years you there was a, there was something you spoke about and and i guess this goes back to uh what you're men mentioning about the collective you know and uh you were playing the the pyramid stage at glastonbury with faithless and you saw this not it wasn't just about yourselves on stage it wasn't just about the the people out there it was one big almost organism like a collective of of people and then you speak also about music as liberation in places like places in west africa that whole collective idea again was something that was not that it was new to me but it was the way you you put it and we like i can't say i've been in front of like all those people at the pyramid stage, you've had that experience. Not many people have had. Um, can you describe how you felt at, at that time? Um, well, I can. I can have a have a go. <laughs> okay. I mean, faithless were really good for that. I mean, you don't get that. You don't get quite that sort of feeling of unity and shared euphoria and kind of being on a journey together, a physical and emotional journey together you don't get that with every band but with faithless on a good night you, you really did get it and it was a, 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 a real privilege to be you know a part of the band um but if i had to sum the feeling up in one word then that word would be connection mm -hmm. you know a real l profound sense of connection with the, the other musicians on stage but also the audience and and I think that one of the reasons why that is so powerful, Derek, is because we live lives that are often quite disconnected. Um, to quote Marx again, he, 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 he would use the word alienated or alienation, and he puts it down to the way that the economy is organized. I mean, you know, let's park a kind of an ec econ econom economistic, I can't even say it, it's part of the conversation about economics and politics, but, but I think that wherever it comes from, it's certainly the case that many of us feel slightly out of kilter and lonely and atomized, slightly like we're floating through our lives and and um, things don't feel quite right. And, you know, you feel a sense of of um, a, a sense that there's a different you or that you should be living a different life and so on you know this there's this sense of yearning for something better um and you get glimpses of it and so i suppose that feeling of connectedness is a glimpse of it that feeling that hang on a minute you know we're not these individual consumers who are sort of told to feel miserable about ourselves and then to buy something in order to fix that feeling and um that no we're brilliant you know we're amazing human beings human beings are an amazing young highly gifted species hurtling through the cosmos on this be exquisitely beautiful planet um and it's easy to forget that mm. those things are true and to to be and it's a brilliant way like to to tell us how you experienced it was was really beautifully written in the book because it kind of made me wonder you know it's again about that idea of like what if i had continued playing a guitar and and you know we all do that as you said do you think that like 
there's bands and there's artists and there's groups that are, you know, overtly political and, and, and you know, um, wear it on their sleeves. There's others who may hold back a little. Um, there's there's recent example, well, fairly recent examples, I guess, of someone like the Dixie Chicks, for instance, a, a group that you would think you wrote about this in the book and a group that you would think well, they're not going to go out of that comfort zone of that they find themselves in very popular country act. And all of a sudden they found themselves, you know, criticizing George Bush. And they must have known when they were doing this, that this would hit their fan base hard. Um, first of all, like, why do you think a group might do that? And second of all, does a group know going into that, that this is almost career suicide? <laughs> well, first of all, it's not always career suicide. You've, but you've picked an example where certainly the Dixie Chicks experienced it as that for a while. Um, and actually, to be honest, I, I don't think they would have said what they said on stage at the Shepherd's Bush Empire in London um, if they'd have known how it would have played out. You know, I don't think their intention was to sort of end up uh, with most of the commercial country music stations across America boycotting them. You know, I don't think they anticipated that happening at all. The fact of the matter is that they happened to be booked to play a gig in London. And it co coincided more or less with 2 million people taking to the streets to say no to Tony Blair's war in Iraq. Um, and so on stage, it felt appropriate for them to pass comment, to share their personal opinion, which is that they agree with the protesters and they're ashamed that their president is from Texas. Um, so I, I, I think that they got a shock at the backlash, mm. at how vicious the backlash was. But they subsequently kind of turned it around and worked with Rick Rubin and kind of, you know, they kind of continue to be a very successful band. But other artists, including Jerry Dammers, who I mentioned earlier, find that, um, that being true to who you are as an artist is always the right thing to do, even if you experience commercial peaks and troughs, ups and downs. The fact is that if, if you're true to yourself, if you speak about the things that you care about and you give your honest opinion, then you'll meet the right people in life. Then you'll meet, you know, real friends, real comrades, call them what you will. But you'll, you'll meet people who will be lifelong friends rather than just those who hang around while you've got a record in, you know, the top 10 of the Billboard 100 or whatever, whatever it is, you know. And I, I subscribe very much to that view that people um, should be overtly political if they have that urge. But, um, but they don't have to be, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that I, I think, I, you know, probably my the most profound musical experience I've enjoyed this summer was seeing an artist who's based in New York of Pakistani heritage, an artist called Aruj Aftab, who um, has a, I think it's a Grammy award winning album, actually, it's a well known album now, but I was seeing um, them perform for the first time at Glastonbury a month or so ago, and I was absolutely blown away. It was, it really had a huge impact on me and I could tell on the people around me and, and, you know, they're writing about love. Mm. That's fine. That's fine. So, you know, I don't think that people should be, um, I don't think that people should feel that they have to write about politics, but on the other hand, if they choose to, and the politics are good, which of course they're not always, but if, if, if they're progressive politics, if they're politics, which we agree will lead to a better world, then we should support them and encourage them. That's yeah. Absolutely. Um, you, you are, uh, you are someone who is quite happy to, to go out there and, and, uh, you know, you're obviously politically active, but you did write a song freedom for Palestine, which, uh, which, well, while not only a very good song, it did annoy some people, and you were, uh, you know, seen as a very naughty boy by uh, certain parts of uh, even Fox News. What a, but you know, let's let's be fair. That, that's not a bad thing to be uh, to upset Fox News. But what was it about that um, the movement that that you know? I know you made your trips to Palestine as well, and um, what made you want to write that song? Yeah, well, it, it was. It was an issue i mean you know a bit like well a lot like the nelson mandela issue 
sort of a couple of decades before. Um, it was an issue I didn't know much about, but Faithless were playing in Israel, I think in 1998. Um, and on my day off, I decided it would be interesting rather than just, I'm not, I'm not much into sunbathing. Um, so I thought rather than go to the beach, instead I'll have a look and see what life is like in Gaza City. And it was quite a complicated journey. I mean, it's not a journey that many people make from Tel Aviv to Gaza City, except I suppose, you know, NGOs are members of the military or whatever, uh, although NGOs are banned now as well. But, um, but I made the trip back then. And then the same sort of thing happened a few years later, Faithless were playing there and I'd made some friends and then I made some music with some friends, some Palestinian friends living in the West Bank. And I became more and more clued up about the situation, about the historic role that Britain, the British government has played in um, creating this dreadful situation. And for me, it became very clear that this was a human rights issue. This fundamentally had nothing to do with religion. This was not to um, equal sides bickering over a piece of land. This was, you know, one heavily armed, uh, backed by America and pretty much all of the big imperialist countries, state absolutely ignoring the basic human rights of, 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 of the people living in an enclosure right next door. It's so clearly wrong when you go there that, you know, I felt like I had to do something. But it's true that this issue is one that's very misunderstood and we've been misled. We are constantly misled. And one of the ways in which the debate is shut down is because uh, is, is, is by uh, pe anyone who um, articulates uh, pro-Palestinian sentiments will be branded anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. including, of course, um, Jewish people who have played leading roles against racism all of their adult lives, you know. So there's, there's, there's no, um, no logic to this, but that doesn't matter. The, the point is that if you're a slightly wobbly liberal, then you'll, <laughs> then you'll steer clear of that issue. And of course, that's what they want people to do is to steer clear of that issue. And we shouldn't, mm -hmm. we should, we should be as clear sighted about the suffering of the Palestinians and how it needs to end as we are about the suffering of, uh, of, of people in Ukraine at the moment um, or, or people in Tibet and so on. You know, it, it's, it's an issue that everybody should be upset about. Um, having said that, um, you know, it is a limited number of people who have so far sort of put their head above the parapet. It's a growing list of artists, but you're right, I did receive flack. And I didn't enjoy that. It was unpleasant, but I think that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when I think about other people, other musicians who have taken political positions and paid for their courage with their lives, and I give some examples of that in the book, well, the least I can do is kind of, you know, um, defend myself on social media and, you know, so on. That's the very least I can do. Um, someone who's been very political, uh, their whole life really is is Sinead O'Connor. Um, she makes like a lot of headlines over in Ireland uh, because her words hold a lot of weight. Um, and she made a couple of decisions, you know, as well, going back to what the Dixie Chicks did, like Sinead O'Connor knew exactly what she was doing on SNL all those years ago by ripping up the picture of the Pope. The people in Ireland... Um, while maybe not fully supportive, they knew what she was doing as well and the reasons behind it. But in America, it was seen as a as a completely different thing and, you know, a, a traitor to, to, you know, Catholicism. Um, she's gone on since and talked about mental health. She's huge, uh, talks about mental health an awful lot in Ireland. And it's a wonderful thing because for someone with her with her weight, to come back and, and say, you know, talk about these things and the tragedy she's been through, and especially in recent years. Um, were, like, what was it when you started working with someone like Sinead O'Connor? Um, what was it? How did that come about? Is that one of those things that you mentioned about, like, kind of a friend's yeah. kind of in the, within the music industry? Yes, it was. It was, um, you know, a recommendation. It was Ash Sone, the great drummer who's just been out with Tori Amos and then um who's he out with at the moment but he you know he, ash stone is is one of the kind of go-to uh session drummers in in the british and and global music industry and he was working or he'd been recruited by 
Kieran Keeley, uh, Sinead's musical director at the time. Uh, he'd been recruited to the band and, Ke and uh, Kieran said, you know, what guitarist might work for this gig? And uh, Ash put me forward and I got the job and it was a real honor. Um, and you're right. I think that the way that Sinead talks about mental health is courageous and useful and brilliant. But I also think she's been vindicated politically in all sorts of ways. I think she's been incredibly courageous politically, not only uh, the famous incident that you referred to, but in all sorts of ways in her songs. And when I was working with her, she came on stage wearing a hoodie in solidarity with uh, Trayvon Martin, mm. who has been murdered by that vigilante and, and the police. You know, it was, it was one of the one of the things that led to the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and um, and she said things in solidarity with Palestine, the issue we were just talking about. So, you know, uh, so I think that politically she's spot on. As, as far as I'm aware, pretty much all of the time and, and has been vindicated um, for her political positions, you know. So I've got great admiration for Sinead um, and it was a real honour to work with her. Uh, I think because of her, you know, being so honest and open about things, I think people are can still be a little bit kind of snide about her because... Uh, a lot of the times when I hear her talk on, on video and stuff like that, she might be in the middle of a of a you know an episode, a mental health episode, and the the kind of sad things about that because I've been there, you know, that people will stop taking you seriously at that point. It's not like when you're completely lucid and you're speaking about your mental health problems that maybe happened last week, people kind of take it seriously. But when you're in the middle of it, they kind of, I don't know, but I can't obviously speak for England, but you know what, speaking from an Irish point of view, they can be quite dismissive of, of, of someone who's in the middle of it. I think that's a, that's a real shame. And it's something that we need to get around to. Again, it's what you mentioned about your childhood. We were kind of hiding stuff away. Then it's still, it's coming into the open now, but we're still not quite there where, when people are in the, in the worst states, we have to kind of believe what they're saying to kind of, in order to kind of help them the way we should. Yeah. And, and we're all flawed. Hmm. You know, we all have the useful contributions to make and we all have far less useful contributions to make. Um, I, I think because of Sinead's fondness for communication through social media, you kind of, um, you kind of get, in a way, you kind of get a lot of both from mm -hmm. a lot of useful stuff and a lot of stuff that perhaps um, makes it easier for the cynics yeah. politics to dismiss her. Um, but 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 in in a less kind of um, perhaps in, in in a less uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, in 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 a lesser way. Let's just put it like that. In a lesser way, I think that's true to some extent of all of us you know and i think the point is not that it's not that we demand consistency from each other on all of the time on every issue but instead that we actually support one another um and, and try and work together to to change society to change attitudes in society on, on all of these questions that we've been talking about of course mental health but also the things that uh, the other things that Sinead cares about like racism mm. like imperialism and, um, and and justice and so on. So uh, yeah, yeah, I can see that she's in a sense an easy target for the critics. But then again, if critics want to target you, you're doing something right. This is, this is it. Um, look, there's so, obviously there's so many things we could have talked about. Um, is there any plans for another book? Yes. Okay. Will answer. Um, and um, I've been, I've had a period of personal changes, all of them positive, but I've moved house, I've become a dad. And prior to that, of course, we had the lockdowns. Um, and, um, and so it's taken a bit longer than I expected, but there will be another book and there will also be um, some more music coming soon. I'm actually um, involved at the moment in a new music project, which I'm quite excited about. So that's, that's the first thing. And then I'll also be tackling a new book i'm sure brilliant i didn't even mention the beatles in, in a music episode i didn't even mention the beatles which for me is some sort of a record as i mentioned most of the time but look I, I would definitely like direct people towards the book because you know there's 
talk about the Beatles. I didn't get to Beyonce, which was another massive thing at the time with the whole Super Bowl show and the, the fallout that happened after. Um, another question we just always ask uh, towards the end, uh, Davis, is what do you like to do in your spare time if you indeed have any? <laughs> well, you know, my, my son is going to be two years old in September. So, no, I don't really have any spare time um, because... You know, if I'm not looking after him or in, or enjoying a bit of downtime with my partner, mm. then then I'm making music, which I love. So making music, although it's been my job for many years, that that still feels kind of like a hobby in 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 in, in the good sense. You know, still feels like a, I'm an amateur in the yeah. true sense of that word. I, I still feel a lot of love for making music, um, but that that seems like a bit of a cop out of an answer. <laughs> worked out that's a bit more witty and perhaps even a bit more honest Derek but I I, I don't <laughs> that's okay no I I think it's absolutely amazing to think that the thing that you love to do is both your job and your your hobby as such and and a thing that you continue to be creative with and and learn and it's ne it's never ending you know that's the thing about music it's it's the beautiful thing about um music uh you do have a YouTube channel if people want to go and check out some of the stuff you do on there yes I do um God, I can't remember it, but if you, if you, I mean, I can't remember the URL, but yeah, you, if you were to search for Dave Randall Slovo, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'd find, or, or perhaps Dave Randall Faithless, but certainly Dave Randall Slovo, then I'm sure you'll find the channel. And on that channel, you'll find all sorts of things, including the most recent Slovo album, but also a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Derek. No, of course. <laughs> I loved it. There was some Zoom uh, performances that you did, obviously, during the, the, the two years that were I absolutely loved. Um, check out the book, Sound System, The Political Power of Music. Uh, Dave, you were an absolutely wonderful guest. I was looking forward to it. You didn't let me down. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Derek. Um, Dave, if you don't mind, I know, but look, if you don't mind sticking around for one minute, yeah. I'm finishing it out. I just take one photo. It's a, it's a tradition at this point. I take one photo of the screen and we're done. So listen, I wanted to thank John as well for everything he does for me. Uh, my mom and dad, my granddad, Jaron Calvin, uh, YouTube subscribe like I said at the start and we're on Instagram Facebook Twitter all the usual places the podcasts are Spotify Apple Anchor Google Podcasts there's some other ones I will one day 134 episodes I promise one day I will learn the other ones but it's today is not the day um, like I said thank you everyone for tuning in and once again Dave thank you so much pleasure okay everyone we will be back next week take care